Hi, how's it in the name of Christ? How you doing? It's your girl Cran K. Gigarabo. I hope you are good. I hope you're peachy. I hope you're stellar. And I hope you're in a neat little bunch. If you're not, welcome to the party. Because that's just the story of our lives now, isn't it? Okay. Uh, it is presently the 24th of May 2024. But it's actually the 23rd. Because I'm skipping over into the next day. I am backlogged um, by a day, but it's okay, I'll eventually catch up. I'll probably upload two batches of content on one day or upload some of, or upload my content, sorry, much later than usual that I might catch up, but I am presently backlogged because my computer was super slow, but I found a workaround and um, thankfully that's like a whole thing. Uh, yeah, it frustrates me severely when I'm backlogged because I am pedantic about uploading daily. And when I don't, I feel like I'm conquered or defeated or something. Like, I have not reached my milestones. But we all know that that's not what's really going on. Because, frankly, I'm recording the work. I'm doing the work. I'm just not able to get it online on time. And I have a thing about schedule. But, anyway. Let me not get all pedantic. Because it's it doesn't matter. Eventually, the work is going to go up. Okay? Let me not panic or fret or front. Let me put some caveats out there. Kindly look out for my captions. They're not always accurate. They sometimes use a small G for God, so they're not very reverential. They also are misspelled. Sometimes it's the wrong word altogether. All such things. It's not me. Uh, one day in the future, God willing, uh, I will edit them. I will invest in ed editing them or hire somebody to do them if there is no rapture first. But for now, I don't have an incentive to because my content, my long form content, sorry, is not being viewed. Okay, so it's not worth it for me to just get dig into making sure that my captions are accurate. It would take too long. Okay, yeah. Uh, what else? I'm also very potentially wearing app makeup. If I am, you'll know. If I'm not, you'll also know. Um, if I am wearing it, it's going to be bouncing off and on my face. So just look out for that. I'm not shape shifting. And then I have a segment. Yes, we added all the time because it's our intro and we're sticking to it. Mm. Pinching my cheeks in these streets that I might display that I'm human. When you prick me, I bleed. When you stab me, I might pass away. I need hospitalization. I'm a person. I've got blood in my body. So kindly just do a better thing and stop treating me like trash. That would be awesome. Yeah, that's why I do what I'm doing here. So it's like basically to just make it clear that I'm only human after all. I'm only human after all. I'm only human after all. I'm only, yeah, uh, don't take a jab at me. Anyway, whatever. I hope we've achieved the goal that we are trying to achieve there. That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm blushing my cheeks that you might see that I've got blood in my body. Anyway, whatever. Moving on. Let's get straight to the point. I made mention of the date 24th of May 2024. Y'all, I don't know where this world is going, alright, um, but one thing that is certain, and I will say this over and over again, time and time shall I repeat myself, yes, um, I do not want to lean on nothing but the rapture. However, when I look at the world around, I don't even know how in the world this is going to work out in the end if the rapture does not happen. I don't know. I don't know where this is going. I thoroughly do not know. The Lord is the one that gives me ideas as to what in the world under heaven I must rap on about each and every single day. And sometimes I just don't want to talk about what he shows me I ought to speak about. I don't want to mention it. I don't want to raise it. I don't want to highlight it. I just, I don't want to talk. Why? Because it's exhausting. It's boring to me. It makes me roll my eyes because it's it's, it's it's fatiguing, if that's even a word. It's draining. It's draining. But I guess, you know, that's just the nature of warnings, of admonitions. You have to just keep on raising a point, highlighting it time and time again, until it ultimately snatches some from the flames of hell or condemns others. The message of the cross is there to either condemn or to save, really. Those who reject it are condemned already and those who embrace it are redeemed uh that's what's good so we gotta speak we gotta speak we gotta speak but they also have got to be idea um what is this it, um uh, re repetition this there's, there's, there's gotta be top like things um examples thank you that's what i was actually gunning for there examples some kinds of examples uh in society that you might understand what in the world is going on yeah all right you guys know how i believe the children are the future <sighs> Goodness gracious. Anyway, let's just get straight into it again, even though we yawned first. A society is made up of children, okay? It's made up of big people too, but really and truly it is built by children. It will ultimately, it's children that eventually become adults, all right? Children that become adults. 
<laughs> I'm torn. All right, so we are in the last days, that's clear. I mean, that's that's not something anybody can dispute right now. If at all, you're going to be honest with oneself. We're in the last days, but um, how last? We don't know, right? It's been a minute. Like, it's been the last days for the, for a minute. It's been it's pretty much since Christ passed away and then got resurrected. It's been the last days. So when we speak about last days, um, we can't really qualify 100% of the time as just how lost it is lost. And I have been going back to God over and over again on some God. Is it really there? Are we really there? Have we arrived? You know, are we are we at a parking lot now? Uh, because the vehicle has been driving and now it's time for it to stop because we've gotten to our destination. And I've been seeking the Lord's face for confirmation. And, you know, I, I feel like uh, Gideon at this point because... He already gave me confirmation and I've been doing videos about such, such confirmation as that. But I keep on sending out a fleece anyway, asking for Jew the next morning. Next morning, because I have a severity of skepticism dwelling in my bones. I spoke yesterday about how it is. Um, was it yesterday or the or day? No, it was day before yesterday's message. The Lord basically calling me a Thomas, like in the worst way. Where it is that I was singing that medley of music. He is calling me Thomas, like in the worst way. Like Thomas, Thomas doubting that's what you are you're doing in these streets you are doubting what i keep telling you and unlike gideon i'm not even putting out two one like one fleece and then an, another one i don't know how many fleeces i've put out like a lot okay and the lord has been faithful to put you on every last one of those fleeces that i'm sending for those of you who don't even know what i'm talking about i apologize i'm just i'm assuming that i'm speaking to people who have read the bible in certain parts uh, gideon is this dude in the bible that was told to do a particular thing uh to go to war or something right i stand created as to the details of the story you're gonna have to go and read it yourself and he he was uncertain as to whether or not it was God speaking or if that's what God was telling him to do. So he said, he said to the Lord, if you indeed, this is what you want me to do, I'm going to put out a fleece and uh, put dew on it. Uh, and then I will know that you have said that that's what I must do. And then the next morning he wakes up and booyah, there's like fleece on the dew, dew on the fleece. He then did the same thing again the next day, but this time around it was the opposite where it is that uh, there is dew on it. Make sure that there is no dew. I stand created. Please get the true, the full on story. Okay, guys, get the full-on story from the Bible. Don't come at me with a flying kick for inaccuracy. I, I have confessed that I don't have the 100% accuracy of that story. But I do know that the story of Gideon is basically used a lot in the body of Christ by believers who... Uh, who want to gain confirmation from God. If at all, they should do something or say something. They put out fleeces, proverbial fleeces, and that they're like, okay, God, if this is what you really want me to say, give me a dream. If this is happening, please show me a sign. Please, what not? We do that all the time. Uh, it's it's a Gideon fleece, that thing. When when you are trying to get confirmation from God by, by, by such things as these. Like the other day I sent out a fleece, I was like, God, if the rapture is happening as on day before yesterday, please, please give me a rapture dream. And then I got that, that, uh, uh, no, I'll I love you for a thousand years song. Mm. A fleece out there was responded to. And I keep sending these fleeces out. And I think the Lord is gracious to give me, um, the fleece response because I'm sorrowful. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm in a lot of a doubt, angst. Uh, I'm constantly cre creasing my forehead on some really when is this gonna end it's just rubbish 24 hours a day like what right waking up it's just such a drag going through the day yet more drag um enduring just a second is a drag yeah and it is imperative therefore for somebody who is enduring that level of dragginess to be awarded a fleece it is um uh, what is this it, you know hope deferred makes the heart sick but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life my heart is sick and so god is having mercy on my unbelief and my doubt that's what i'm getting at okay yeah cool beans and bananas so uh now that you know what what the gideon fleece is about those of you who are not as well versed with the bible yeah it's a story about a guy that just wanted to get confirmation about whether or not he should go to war okay yeah and it's used to metaphorically describe christian confusion um as to what they need to do from god all right and i've got confusion concerning the rapture lots of it because of the fact that i feel like i've gotten a lot of conflicting understanding as to what's gonna happen with me sometimes i feel like you know I, I, the lord has shown me that i'm gonna get my breakthrough i'm gonna be okay but then sometimes i feel like he keeps showing me that this is not good this is gonna end with a destruction of my enemies and I, like can both be true how i do not know and i've been speaking about that at length so i am skeptical i i speak what it is that is sitting on my heart but then i afterwards feel like but really 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 
And with me being like really, 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 God then gives me something to look at out here in these streets. Perhaps maybe the reason why there's just so much conflict of understanding is because should the human race repent, then I will have a future. But should they not, then I won't. Maybe that those are the, vi the different outcomes. Like, it's like, how can I describe it? Like, all right, Jonah is the perfect example, right? Jonah was a prophet that was sent to preach to a city, a country, telling them that it's over for you, you're done for, because you're evil, right? He, upon preaching destruction to Nineveh, however, understood deep down inside that if they turn their heads back to God, if they decide to repent, the Lord is not going to fulfill his wrath against them. Fulfill his predicted wrath against them. So the prophet's dilemma in that instance is, I'm going to prophesy and then people are going to call me a false prophet because of the fact that what I prophesied did not come to pass. Notwithstanding the fact that that which was prophesied or watchman, that which was proclaimed on the rooftop, um, was repented from. People stayed themselves from continuing in this fashion and seeing as the Lord is appeased by an act of repentance, he will not despise a broken and a contrite spirit. He therefore does not judge a land that decides to turn away from its wicked ways. Anyway, he's not like that. He doesn't insist on punishing. He's not a grudge holder. He's not that God. And so therefore, if people repent and turn from their wicked ways the lord does heal the land he stays his hand from finishing them off he warns them starkly and if they repent he does not afflict but every so often in the corners lurking are people that are happy to pounce on you jump and say you said this is going to happen to Nineveh and look, it's still thriving. It's a going concern. The sun is rising and setting every day and the people are still up and down these streets walking in it. You lied, Jonah, you lied. Except Jonah did not lie. Jonah pronounced a judgment that was definitely coming. And the Ninevites reacted with contriteness, with repentance, with fasting, with praying, with all of that jazz. Okay, and that was the thing that Jonah was complaining about. He was on some, you're going to mess with my prophetic reputation, with, with, with my, th my thing that I'm doing actually in these streets because I know how you is, God. I know how you are. You, you go out, you'll be giving these people mercy just because they said sorry. And so I'm going to look real bad as a prophet. And that's what happened with the whole tree story where it is that he was given shade for a minute and then the shade was taken away and he was like oh complaining and crying and god was like yeah exactly that shade is like Nineveh why must I give you shade here it is that you are being protected from the scorching sun shall I not award the same grace to Nineveh right that's what god was was saying to uh, Jonah over there so those who have prophecies that they profess proclaim on rooftops in even the modern day and yes, I do believe that God does raise up modern day prophets. I'm not a cessationist, even in the slightest. Okay, yeah, every so often they prophesy stuff and it does not come to pass precisely because people did better, precisely because people repented. So I have been rocking up for a minute here, speaking about how it is that these randos going to die. They're going to cease to exist. The Lord is going to judge them with the end of themselves. Uh, yesterday I just, uh, the day before, or oh, was it yesterday when I was doing the video about how it is that um, people are passing me up thinking that they're doing themselves uh, a, a disservice if at all they were to heed any kind of support in their bones for me because they imagine that my poverty is too taxing and yet I'm like, but I'm dodging a bullet when you act so shallow where I am concerned. And I, in that video where I was describing that particular scenario, I, I, I used the example of Ibrahim Raisi and I was like, don't get on the copter. You know, don't get on the proverbial copter. Don't get on the helicopter that you might not pass away because God does not delight in the death of him who dieth. And so therefore, if a person has been warned, it, you're going to die because you're a menace to society with all of your sorcery. If they decide not to get on the helicopter, in other words, if they decide to stop doing what they're doing because they re they're scared and they're co they've got consternation, they're trepidatious. And so every single time they cast a spell, something, so a, a sense of foreboding comes over them. And then one day they make a decision, you know what, no, nah, I'm stopping this stuff because I'm not going to call that bluff. I'm not going to take my chances. Yeah, they were literally en route getting on a helicopter but then they made a decision to take the train instead and the copter crashed but the train got to the destination the person lived to tell the story and so the person who told them you're gonna die in that copter 
in a crash because you're dastardly yeah might appear to have basically prophesied incorrectly when rather what happened here was that the person in question heeded that admonition heeded that warning and decided to stay themselves from continuing in so a dastardly fashion as this they made a decision to stop being menaces and so God spares their lives because he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and all that. Because he does not delight in the death of him who dieth. And so therefore when a person heeds their brokenness, when a person decides to lay themselves prostrate before God and mourn their sin, he's not going to finish them off anyway. That little dilemma is what it is that I find myself in every so often. I find myself caught in that rock in that hard place where it is that I have literally seen prophetically a very happy future with very many children and a very doting husband and a very glad circumstance and for me it's like yay okay cool let's look forward to that but you know TikTok at the end of the day I'm 40 very soon so can we just get this moving already yeah and then next thing i go to bed at night i sleep and i see this desolate wasteland this finished off country this finished off planet i see this deadbeat zombie apocalypse i see all of this devastation that is global this cataclysmia that is global and i'm like but when then does the husband come I can't understand it like when 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 is my child gonna get born in this desolate wasteland when all this river water or ocean water has reached the height of Johannesburg like when when what am I seeing and at what point at what juncture like how is this gonna end some days I get communicated to that I will be a holocaust survivor like the Jews that got out of that horrible situation that however imagine they were living at the very end of the end of the end of the end because of that level of oppression and tyranny but then they some of them got lived to tell the story some of them lived to um even write books and everything about their experiences at Auschwitz and all that jazz yeah yeah some days I see holocaust survival so this horrible witchcraft epidemic in the country this chaos this cosmic chaos in the country yeah i see it being a holocaust that ends and there are survivors and i'm one of them and if at all i become a holocaust survivor tantamount equivalent right yeah that means there is a future it means i'm gonna get to be a person that was once upon a time in a death camp but now i'm a wife and a mother and i'm telling the story i've written a book yeah other times however like i said i see desolation comprehensive extinction annihilation I hear a quarter weed for a denarius, a quarter of, um, uh, what is this? Is it a, 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 a quarter of wheat for a denarius? Three quarts of uh, weed for barley or something. I stand corrected what that scripture is, but do not harm the oil and the wine. I hear that. And that speaks about the famine that's coming in the um, horseman of the apocalypse with the scales in his hands. I believe the color is black over there. And that's the commencement of the tribulation. So I'm like, What's happening here? Holocaust survival or a quarter weed for a denarius. Do not harm the oil and the wine. What's going on? Like, I don't know. Like, what, what is happening? Even with the death of Ibrahim Raisi, I'm like, he is, he was judged. That's, he was co condemned because of his affliction of Israel and the most recent attacks. And when then the Lord is taking up the cause of Israel prior to the rapture to stay the enemies that are about her from essentially doing the most and finishing Israel off it says there is still some time because there is going to come a, a time in the future when Israel is entirely naked and unable to do anything for itself with no support and when then events turn so as to evidence that maybe Israel still has a little bit more time on the side of the rapture it tells me that okay maybe my husband is coming because uh, really we look at the middle east over here okay maybe my my children are coming and all that jazz even though my biological clock is ticking and all that jazz and i'm concerned but maybe it's coming maybe it's coming maybe it's coming and then um canada makes a decision to hook up a law to essentially imprison anybody that is regarded as having participated in hate speech and i'm like i mean like yeah when stuff like this is happening we are five seconds away from the mark of the beast. We are five seconds away from some police state martial law society. When a first world country like Canada can do strange stuff of that nature, you know? 
I, I look at what's happening and today I happened upon more information on the internet about my own country. A chaos and a calamity that's happening globally. However, you know, it's Aja oozing vapor dust in South Africa too. And I'm like, okay, so we're at the end, we're at the end, we're at the end. We're at the end. But then, but then the thing that's happening in South Africa made me think about another thing in, in the US presently. They, well, about, about a week and a half ago, there's these kids, these middle school kids. So that would be like primary school grade, what guys, three, ne? To like grade nine or something. I don't know, whatever. Middle school, they call it middle school. Um, so yeah, essentially lament that they came and they protested against this gender i never mind gender this diversity equity and inclusion rubbish thing where it is that now you can be whatever you identify as and there's some kids going to school acting like they're cats and dogs furries basically and they go to school wearing mascot suits of furry animals and they act like these furry animals so if you're a cat you're feisty you're scratchy and whatnot and they scratch other kids and they uh they 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 they, they, they you get my point they act like animals and the teachers are just letting them do this because it's their gender identity and they, 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 it's who they identify as. It's, it's what it is. They, they just be kind, be nice. Don't complain. Just let it be. Let it be. And so seeing as the parents, seeing as the teachers in the school are not doing anything about this absurdity, the kids themselves took to the streets and protested like some 11 year olds out here protested and news networks covered it where it is that the kids are now fed up so you know i don't believe that children are the future i look at this and i'm like okay okay middle school school kids out here rebelling against the wickedness in society which is good they are putting grown-ups who are stupid at this point in their place and seeing as they're the future i guess we're safe we're good like if, if these middle skill school kids have more sobriety than their teachers and their principal in the school we we still might have another 10 years 20 15. you know we, we still might have some time i still might be able to raise children in a society where they can have friends like those that realize that it's unacceptable to have some mascot sitting around in a classroom wearing a, a big fat furry suit claiming to be a student like proper if the kids see it maybe there's a hope maybe there's hope and then other stuff happens and other yeah pop, pop, just a lot of conflicting stuff that's going on a lot of resistance a lot of uh, pushback a lot of to and fro and it's made me and i just also recently found out that it you know Kimang Schwabi, klaus Schwab of the world economic forum is not going to be w the head of it in 2025 which it's looking up but they always find another nefarious leader to, leader to take on the reins but he had some pretty bizarre ideas as to what under heaven needs to happen and he's stepping down in 2025 so i'm just like okay that's looking positive that's looking positive it, it's, it's not looking too bad it's not looking too bad and then you look around as well at celebrities a lot of them out here pushing back against the absurdity of the entertainment industry and they're doing it boldly and it's like okay good 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 you know but then at the same time they are then getting a lash back against other people in the same industry essentially threatening their careers sports stars who are you know raising issues and then others that are bringing them down there's just a lot of to and from to and from to and from with some people resisting even among the youth while others are just pushing total chaos total cray cray and just like the observation of global events swinging me to and fro to extremes so too are my uh, dreams so too is the prophetic understanding that i'm being given also diametrically opposed and i don't know what's happening and i'm trying to understand like yesterday i spoke at length about the prospect of a doting husband Whereas the day before, I spoke about how it is that, guys, it's the end, it's over. I look bipolar. I sound bipolar. It's like, I'm, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. I'm caught between worlds. And the question in my heart is, God, what's going on? So I keep on sending out a fleece, right? Like Gideon. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. And the only conclusion that I can reach at this point is that this could go either way. This situation down here in these streets could go either way. And literally the ball is in the court of the human race. And if the ball is in the court of the human race, who is in a position to convince them for one side or the other? The human race is individuals that are advocates for either side. And those that are advocates for sobriety are Christian. And other people who are yet to be taken by the tsunami of absurd ideologies. And I'm one of those that are still trying to hold fast to basic soundness. 
but I am being sat on the chest of by a crazy conglomerate of human souls that in their narcissism and in their selfishness are holding on to a person with a very important message that from what I see actually has got power to stay God's hand from finishing this earth off. There are enough resisting voices for the Lord to for their sake give the human race time. But if at all we get overpowered by the wicked forces that are speaking smack against our image in God, the Lord will then end this concern entirely. And I've been saying it that if at all there are no longer people coming to Christ or not enough, the Lord is not good. There's no incentive for him to do this anymore because he is gathering for himself a people for his own possession. And if people are disinterested in being gathered to a holy God, what's the point this earth belongs to the meek who shall inherit the earth and the millennial reign of jesus christ is an, a, a space and an environment where that is made 100 percent a reality so it will not be delayed any further if at all the world is so cataclysmic so chaotic in wickedness that it is no longer sufferable to a holy god he will not endure or suffer us indefinitely in wickedness so those of us who are spokespeople for a better way of being if you want to call it that. The more you smother us, the more you close us in your shallow dispositions, in little huts, selfishly hoarding people that belong to the human race. They, be they don't belong to you. I don't belong to any individual person. I belong to God first and secondly to humanity. I have a cause or a job to influence my part in it anyway, as there are many like me. The human race to towards a particular way of thinking. And just the fact that I've got these absurd men trying to put me in their houses and then smother one sober voice, which is one sober voice too many. You can add a multiplier to it and therefore recognize how many more of us are being smothered to a point therefore then of silencing those voices that can highlight that it's entirely unacceptable to allow kids wearing mascot suits acting like cats and dogs in school to continue to have their way. Where when there's nobody speaking that anymore, What's the point? This here is there's no longer a point. There's no longer a purpose to this. There's no and the way that the wicked are so selfish, they cannot stop for a minute to inhale, exhale, breathe, and essentially choose the bigger picture. Choose the bigger picture instead of their own vain ambition, their own selfish ambition indeed. It is written in God's word in 2 Timothy 3 that these human individuals are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All they can think about is me, 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 and how does this satiate me? How does this satisfy me? Instead of what is happening to society at large? What is happening to our ecosystem at large? What are the inputs into society looking like? And what are the outputs therefore as a result of what inputs we put in? And if all the inputs or largely, if most of the inputs are just rubbish, this thing is no longer sustainable. This human race of ours can't even survive its own insanity. It cannot survive its own futility. It can't. And if you're going to go and grab the sober voices on the earth and constantly insist that they sit as Stepford wives under deadbeat sorcery men, what is the point? If you insist that a woman cannot make a single cent and so rescue herself, salvage herself from obscurity, that is speaking such lofty things on the rooftops, you are to extracting sober minds, sober voices from society that are staying your children from going to school, having to just ride out some silly children in the class wearing mascot suits claiming to be cats and dogs. That is the future that you're facing. And the scenario that I was given to that not scenario, the batch of stories that I was given today was from this nation, South Africa. I'm South African. I don't know what's going on, guys. I'm, I'm torn. I'm confused. I'm in between worlds and I don't like the polarity of what it is that I am experiencing daily. I don't like that I am sometimes in end times mode to a point where I might as well just sit packed bags and everything at a bus stop and wait for the rapture versus maintaining myself in a position to be found by one who will say, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, my husband. For me to go into a future and for me to anticipate a, a journey of healing from all the trauma I endured because I'm gonna have to live. After all, I'm a Holocaust survivor. Life goes on. I went through a lot. Life goes on. South Africa was chaotic with sorcery, but life goes on. And I can't latch on to the sorrow of the pain during the duration of time that I was going through it um, to a point of being unable, therefore, to move forward with my life. I am always caught between those two worlds. 
pendulously swinging from left to right and I, I i want rest i want to have a true north now i really do and i keep going to the lord on some what what what, what must i believe because you show it all you show it all you show it all to me what, what 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 how am i supposed to understand what you're showing me when you show it all for for, for fear of sounding false like i'm hearing phantoms confirm to me what's going on and then i get all this like I said, conflicting understanding anyway. And the only conclusion that I can reach with any level of wisdom using the Bible is that what must be happening is grace being awarded and an opportunity therefore being made possible to stay wrath should they repent. But if they don't, it's over. If they don't repent, it's over. If they do not repent, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, but do not harm the oil and the wine. We are dealing with the rider on the white horse, the pale horse, the black horse, and the red horse. We are dealing with the commencement of the Hunger Games, global unrest, global cataclysmia, with the extraction of just Christians. If people don't stop with the rubbish that they have made an observation, it's just that, rubbish. If they don't quit their nonsense, they cannot imagine that they are operating in a silo, uniquely afflicting their little controlled radius and so therefore are not impacting an entire earth there are ramifications to actions there are causes to every effect and effects to every causes this is how can i even put this this the situation is not without comeuppance should it be maintained in this fashion because nothing in history has ever been without comeuppance that is evil it nothing has ever been left to merely linger thrive rot in a downward spiral of like headed towards entropy amidst a human race that is inherently self-preserving and the fact that the years have continued to progress with us being alive was the very thing that made eventually something cauterize that wound something ultimately stopped the bleed and that's why today we can still call 2024 2024 that's why the world did not end in 1994 in 1972 that's why the world didn't end in 1958 that's why the world didn't end during the holocaust world war one world war two it's because something cauterized the wound something stopped it there was a, an amputation a cessation of hostilities there was a ceasefire but an object in motion will stay in motion unless it is acted on by a resisting force so if this year continues on a downward trajectory and nothing stops it, it will head towards entropy for the planet in its entirety. And we are trying, those of us who are voices of reason, to be the cauterizing iron. We are trying to stay the earth from continuing in this foolish trajectory. And I don't know if we're going to succeed. And so I think that's what I'm seeing. A, a, a double-edged sword a two-pronged approach where it is that if they don't repent this is what's going to happen but if they do this is also what's going to happen i'm either getting my future or i'm getting into the sky either way i'm safe i'm either going into the sunset with a doting husband and some wonderful children or i am going literally into the sun i am going upward i am flying i am going to heaven there are only two ways that this can end and it's one of these two and both end well for me However, only one of the ways ends well for my enemies. And the way that ends well for my enemies is if I go into the sunset with my husband and my children. Because if I go into the sky, it will not end well for everybody else. It won't. That's the only conclusion that I can reach at this particular point. It's the only one that I can reach. On YouTube today, I watched a video that made me be like, is this confirmation, God, that we are going home? Is this yet another fleece that Gideon puts out and you've put Jew on it? Is this confirmation because the day before i was out just speaking on a rooftop about how it is that the lord can set apart a wonderful man to love a woman even over the age of 40 because i was lamenting in yesterday's video about people's affliction of my person because of my age and their silly ageism therefore after that i then see all this calamity and i'm like even if i were to get a loving husband and have some children my goodness how am i supposed to feel secure as a mother that is bere bereaved grieved by the world around and am therefore fretful about how my children are going to turn out because i remember when i was growing up that i started out in religious schools catholic schools and i was regulated by those schools but as soon as i moved to a government school all my convictions flew out the window 
and I followed the tidal wave. I followed the tidal wave, so there is a great concern that dwells in my bones about children being raised up in the admonition of the Lord. Uh, however, still nonetheless having to go out there in the world anyway. And then when then they chill in it, sit in it, experience the world, then change their minds or just get taken by that tsunami. It happens all the time to children, to kids that move out of high school and therefore their parents' houses and into university. How it is that these universities are teaching so much incredible rubbish and Christian students, a lot of them are apostatizing because of just being in varsity, because of just going to school. And I spoke at length some other day in all of these videos that I do about how it is that I, I for, for the life of me, seeing as I so strongly desire to be a mother, I will therefore have a very strong love for children. And there is no greater love than the one that God had for the human race other than to give up his own son for us. Therefore, the love that God had rescued us from eternal condemnation. And as a parent, if you're going to emulate the love of God, you ought also sacrifice your own life that your children might live. And so I will have endured how on earth to make doubly sure that I don't end up unequally yoked with an unbeliever so that my children will grow up in a two-parent household raised up in the admonition of the Lord under a heading man that is going to be pious with a godly wife and the two of them are going to teach children in the way that they should go. And when they're older, they will not depart from it. I am dodging bullets of ungodly men. And I spoke in one of my videos about how it is that one of my biggest motivators even of fleeing from unequal yoking is the souls of children. I used a statistic that was shared that said that when a woman, when a, when a child in the household gets redeemed, the likelihood that the whole family is going to follow suit is only 3%. When a mom gets saved, the likelihood that the whole family will get redeemed is 27%. It increases, but not by much, uh, by a lot, but it's not strong enough to bank on the fact that since mom is born again, the kids are going to be cool. It's only 27%. However, when a man turns his life over to God, the likelihood that the whole family is going to follow him with Jesus skyrockets to 80 to 90%. 80 to 90 percent that is the impact that is the influence of a godly man in a household he can save his entire family and so recognizing the authority and the power that god gave men to lead i saw therefore the authority and power that men would have in the opposite direction to to mislead to essentially decay children's souls instead of raise them up in the admonition of the lord i saw that if a man can have that much power to redeem his children he therefore also must have similar power to condemn them. So an ungodly husband is the bane of the souls of the children in the home. And a godly wife to an ungodly man is only 30% prosperous. It only has the, the, so much influence over children. But the dad has more power. So just by looking at those stats, I realized that I would much rather go for a 90% shot, an 80% shot of my kids entering God's rest than hanging out with just my 30%. So whether or not I'm in a lot of attrition right now, pressurized to just take anything that comes my way, just insofar as I have some kind of a semblance of a normal life, somebody's willing to love me, even though they're not all that godly. At the end of the day, it's not just about me. It's about the turn that I will then be giving birth to just to send them to hell because an ungodly man has more, way more power to influence my turn than I ever can. It's that basic. So seeing as I've worked like a dog, to make sure I don't end up unequally yoked with an unbelieving man so that the shots of my children for Christ will be maintained. Seeing as that's what's going on over here, I have concerns then about that remaining 20% of societal influence, you know, nature versus nurture. If at all, the mom and dad are both adoring of Christ, the children being raised up in the admonition of the Lord, you've given them an 80% shot at Christianity. But there's still that 20. There is still that 20% that can toss them to and from by every wind of doctrine. And the only thing that a parent would then lean on to enable that 20% to rather go in the direction that they prefer it to go would be moving to a country, a city, a state that tends to be aligned with your virtues altogether. So living in a Christian nation and living in a Christian province or a Christian state in that nation, a place that is largely conservative or has got um, Christian Judeo principles at its back, at, and, and in its backing, 
enough to influence the schooling system. Enough to influence the schooling system. And South Africa was that once upon a time. Believe it or not, it used to be that. And today, I happened upon some understanding that it's falling away really violently. I told you guys that I do everything in my power to avoid South African media. I do everything in my power to avoid South African content online because I've been bruised, crushed, stepped on like I'm a worm underneath people's shoes by this country. I have moved. I, I'm like a corpse in this country with my spirit being somewhere else. I've already left South Africa. It's that basic. I've been afflicted by my land. So I don't watch their news. I don't follow what they're doing. And largely, I even avoid their social media content creators. I don't want to hear them speak because I'm hurt by my country. But every so often, my shaky finger clicks on something South African and then I find out what's going on and it just confirms to me the judgment. It, it, it just confirms that uh, where, where exactly is this going? This country used to be better. I used to be a patriot for my land. I would never have moved anywhere. I would never have been content to stay anywhere else other than here. It would be my redemption in Christ, me turning over to the Lord, that would get me treated like so much trash that I would ultimately defect from a country before I've even left in physical body. My redemption is 100% correlated to the mistreatment of my person by South Africa. However, South Africa is a Christian country. It's a Christian country. It is, in other words, that, can, that, that nation that is going to help the agenda along of your children being maintained in godliness because of how it is that its general principles are as a nation in totality. Let us first commence with our national anthem. It is Christian. It's a, it's a prayer. Those of you who don't speak my languages, our languages, uh, God protect South Africa, uh, end war, disease, trouble, tumult. Our national anthem is Christian. South Africa is a Christian country. That's what I'm trying to explain to you guys right now. And there was a time when that was felt. There was a time when that was felt. As a child, I grew up in both government and private schools, raised up in both government and private schools. And the private schools that I went to were religious. They were always religious. I went to Catholic schools, two of them, St. Matthew's first in Rockville, Soweto. And then, um, what do you call this? Mayfair Convent in Mayfair, all right? And both these schools, instilled some kind of Christianity or religious they were Catholic right Catholic Catholicism is not Christianity it's not Protestant you guys know that however they do preach from the Bible every so often there's a lot of heresy therein but it's still nonetheless a, a Christian upbringing I, I would call it that okay but I did start at the, my first ever school was was pagan no, I can't really call it Pena okay let me not say it's, it was government it was just a government school in Soweto but I was too formative back then to be to accuse it of anything at all and even then I don't really have any accusation to send its way then I went to St. Matthew's and then Mayfair Convent so for a, a lot of years I was in, in in religious schools then I moved to a government primary school to finish off Winchester Ridge Primary and then I went to a government high school Sir John Adamson and when I was growing up in these schools a kid born in 1984, so raised at the latter part of apartheid entering into the new South Africa, all that jazz. Yeah, um, it was despite the government schools being government Christian entirely. So the first primary school I ever went to, Dumelang in Tladi, Soweto. At assembly, we used to sing the Our Father. Like, you know, the way, the way that it is sung in Sarafina proper. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive the, um, all those who trespassed against us. And you get my point. That was uh, like a, th a whole thing. And in the Soweto schools, because it was a black school, we used to get all like theatrical with it, like dancing and singing and whatnot. And uh, and oh yeah, lasham them like throwing your leg in the sky and dancing with it and whatnot. In that tiny little formative primary school, like grade not grade one, like yeah, very 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 early. 
however every single day without fail every single day every single day in assembly our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven but then of course the Sarafina one is a lot more theatrical our father our father yeah okay yeah hello yes and i mean Sarafina was done in like you know leleti kumalo is she's like slightly younger than my mom like those but like those days lent over into pre-democracy south africa and then into post-democracy south africa i grew up in the transition from apartheid sa to new sa new south africa and it was the same for the entire time all the way up until i got the step in at a high school all the way up until i matriculated that was dumelang right the first school that i went to in soweto uh singing the our father was a daily ritual with other uh hymns other um, gospel songs at assembly i don't even think there was a single non-gospel song that was sung at assembly it was always gospel music at assembly in a government school a government school we used to pray before uh, at this uh, at this government school Dumelang, before lunch before break uh, thank you god for the food that we are about to receive etc and then we went out and played etc and then there was the corporal punishment there was the fact that nobody in these streets got away with any murder kids were super disciplined there was no room for a disrespectful child ever accommodated teachers were given authority to discipline it was within their era the, sorry their sorry not era their 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 scope of responsibilities next to teaching kids they were also awarded essentially parent status for the day for as long as those children were underneath the school were, were on the school premises they were under basically like a teacher jurisdiction schooling jurisdiction and all the rights of the parents were essentially handed down to the teachers to the principal and so kids feared teachers just as much as they feared their moms and their dads and then Never mind, there be, uh, never mind there being that level of discipline. There was also corporal punishment. So the rod. The Bible, it is written therein that don't spare the child the rod, right? Corporal punishment was a law under the old regime. It ultimately got repealed in the new South Africa. Some years after the, re the, the, the enactment of the new statute, a whole bunch of old laws just slowly but surely got squelched, taken out of the way. And all these widespread, un- adulterated and unchecked rights were then just given to some untrained infants is that basic so being hit was a whole thing uh right and then there was the the parents as well so now teachers have got this authority to discipline children at school you know like our teachers in go Melang, that primary school the first one that i ever started out at in soweto the way that was so deep and so extreme when you were naughty the teacher would tell you to go to a tree and pick a branch for yourself from that tree that she's going to hit you with you you choose your own branch choose your own branch so you go to that tree crying knowing that the teacher is going to hit you with it so kids would would bring like these skinny little branches and still it would hurt like no man's business and this like punishment would happen in front of everybody as like a whole example as to what not to do wham 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 on your hand with a stick from a tree that's what's good right when these uh, one time there was this one child in my class that essentially bunked school he escaped during the day to go home his mom or older sister or whatever came to the school brought this boy back and then in front of the whole class was like uh, here it is that a child came back home saying that school is over uh please confirm to me madam if school is really over or is it just over for him and this boy was freaking out scared crying as he was being apprehended okay and everybody every child in the class just kept quiet and watched this thing happen and this boy got a weapon from his sister older sister or mom or whatever in front of the whole class and then went back to sit down finished the rest of the day in class and that the rest of that was history i do not remember a child so out of hand that a teacher would end up running away to cry i don't remember anything of that nature ever happening where kids would be so unruly 
that teachers would end up crying. No, they had the power, like the song, I've got the power. They had the power to subdue unruly children. And parents always took the side of the teacher. They always took the side of the teacher. They always believed the teacher over the kid. In some instances, that might have been dangerous. I can admit that. But for the larger majority, that was what was right. Because here in Last the Deal, this is what is, is written in the Lord's Word. In the heart of a child dwells a great deal of folly. But the rod, whopper, corporal punishment of discipline drives it far away from him. In the heart of a child dwells a great deal of folly, but the rod of discipline drives it far away from that child. So essentially the Bible is saying over there, when you don't spare the child the rod, they get put in a neat little bunch. That boy never bunked school again. And the rest of us were taught a lesson that if we dare do this, we're going to be the next ones humiliated. We were scared of teachers. We feared them. We had the fear of God put in us that we might fear them. Our authority figures, our uh, big uh, people, we obeyed them. Authority, it is written in God's word, you must always obey the authority in your land, in your country. Your president, honor and revere and respect those that have put in authority above you, your teachers in school. And of course, in the household, children, obey your parents. Obey your parents. That's what's good. Yeah. And the old school system that I was growing up in affected that perfectly to a point where... I have never seen in my entire tenure as a student the level of violence in schools that my younger sister, when she was going through school, she was born 17 whole years after me. She was born in 2001. I was born in 1984. Okay. 16 to 17 years older than her I am. And when she was in high school, the horror stories that would come home about what it is that she witnessed and also even in primary. I had never ever in my life experienced anything of that nature in any school that I attended. We've, we had seen cat fights between girls on the school playground and boys also maybe fighting with each other, but not at the level that is going on now and not with the level of violence and brutal force, even lethal, that is presently happening. And this is something that I started to hear in the news media when I was working in corporate South Africa and I was shocked. Like the sword killer, there's a sword killer kid, like he's called the sword killer because he brought a sword like a samurai to school and killed another kid. That happened when I was in corporate South Africa. I could have been maybe 24, 25. And at the time I was, was I with my ex? I can't remember. I think I was dating my ex-boyfriend and we were talking about it, about how it is that this year is like just anomalous. It's weird what is going on. And that was then. It's only ramped up now. It's only gotten worse. And no, it's not national only. It's not South African only. This is global. It's happening across schools in the world. The Bible says, teach a child in the way that he should go. And when he is older, he will not depart from it. Biblical principles are what keep society in a bunch. That that was in grade that was grade one, not not one. Very beginning rudimentary stages. Grade one, two. When I was in Dumelang Primary School, Kosoweto, Kotlari. Then I moved to Saint Matthews, also Soweto. I wasn't there very long. I think a couple of months or no, like I think a year. Like yeah, I wasn't there long before we moved to Mayfair Convent because everybody was now allowed to go and study in. English school, like in, in suburban schools. So as soon as black parents could take their children to schools that were in the burbs, they, they did. And we were among the first to go. So I and we went to Mayfair Convent and then I went to Winchester Ridge Primary, etc. And what have you. But first I went to St. Matthews, which was a Catholic school um, in, in Soweto, Go Gohogville, and in Rockville. Okay. And I was there for, like I said, a year, right? No more than a year. I, I, it wasn't long. And uh, guys, it was just, it was quiet there, man. It was quiet. It, it was quiet. Oh, yes, like it. And it was strict. It was strict. We could not have hair as girls. It was so ridiculous. Goodness, it was just so, so bad. We had the relaxed hair was outlawed. Hair at all on girls was outlawed. And that was based on the fact that girls are not to look anything comely or seemly to boys. That they might turn them on and be all pretty. So we all had to basically look like boys in order that there might not be strange activity going on between girls and boys. It was just primary school and it was very extremely regulated. We used to walk to mass to Roma, the, the, the church 
yeah like every couple of days as classes we take turns and whatnot we were taught by nuns all that jazz and the only naughtiness that existed in that school was girls and boys being like mm, i found out that you like tepo or the tepo likes you that was it like nothing no violence for what never that that i never that never happened there was never any war that i saw no altercation no fighting nothing no kids yeah and of course there was always fear of teachers fear of authority fear the principle was yo godzilla her one footstep could shake the school it, like kids you could be on break lunch break and if this if this principal walked past even though it's your break and you're playing soccer or netball or whatever you you stopped we used to just stop almost as if though hey we, we, we're not like proper we keep it's break so you can run you can shout you can scream as a child playing but if the principal walked by we kept quiet like it was class that's the level of fear that kids had for authority nobody just went out of line and she just because they could no one not even a single child that was in soweto then i moved to mayfair convent same story same story only difference are the demographics there's indian kids now there's white kids there's black kids all different kinds of races but every last one of us in spite of background or culture race religious affiliation there were muslim kids in that catholic school i still don't understand it to this day why why um, muslim parents sent their kids to christian slash catholic schools but nonetheless whatever despite religious background and what have you we all had a same fear and reverence for teachers we had a similar respect for the sanctity of human life fighting never got yeah but when there was not an aggression and anger a fever of it that would cause such hard knock excruciating injury to children that people would need to be hospitalized that, that that never ever 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 happened like ever ever and when a kid got handled basically when a kid got punished at school by a teacher parents agreed they agreed that this kid had it coming i have never in my life seen a parent coming to the school to tell a teacher where to get off a lot of like every time parents came to school it was to tell the child where to get off because she is wreaking havoc in the teacher's life it, it it literally was always about like the kid was always blamed i am not even kidding that is the only time that I've, i had ever seen parents in school and a lot of their children their children were always the ones in trouble never a parent coming to school with a kid sorry with with, with sorry with a teacher being in trouble never the teacher being in trouble never it was always to deal with like this this little child this little brat when zen manji what has he done now when zen juano mm. so we feared teachers and we feared parents as we ought because the fear of god was in society and uh at, i told you guys that mayfair what the saint matthews was catholic so of course there was a lot of hymn singing lots of um uh, gospel stuff lots of bible reading and whatnot similarly to mayfair convent was also a catholic school so we also went to mass walked there there was one just down the road from where it is that we went to school so the religious aspect of it was understandable because it was a catholic school after all left Mayfair, Mayfair convent in the middle of grade five to go to Winchester Ridge primary and that was a government school so it was not largely religiously inclined or anything like that it was wayward to me I and that school was wayward it was wayward they were forward they were a lot more fast than the kids that I left behind at Mayfair convent and they were experimenting with dating and kissing and all that jazz right however every morning assembly we used to sing hymns as the deer pants for the water so my soul longs after you you alone are my heart's desire and i long to worship you you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire yeah you get my point that was at mayfair convent not mayfair sorry winchester rich it was not though i remember those songs from the uh catholic schools right but they transferred over to the what do you call this the um, the government school now that would uh, that would be essentially the tenement of pagan the our father was a whole thing right um 
the i don't even know if kids still like when teachers walk into class stand up and are like good morning mrs the beer like do they still do that or do they just sit around and are like yeah whatever ma'am we were supposed to do that every time a teacher would come into the class from another class so this teacher's coming in to see our teacher our homeroom teacher we would have to stand up and be like good morning mrs thurston and then mrs thurston would be like good morning kids and then we then sit down if another teacher came in good morning mr crowd like proper like like clockwork however many of them came in if, if five came in at the same time we'd have to stand up and greet every last one of them and then only at their permission would we then be told to sit down morning kids fine sit down good afternoon it's okay kids you can sit down you can sit down we, we 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 couldn't just do what we wanted we couldn't just do what we wanted do you understand what i'm saying that was the thing we used to sing hymns in assembly uh even at the government school we used to sing hymns in assembly even in the government school and i don't think there was a single song other than the school song which in and of itself was christian that was not a gospel song we sang gospel it was, it was like a whole church and like praise and worship session in the mornings in school every single day or every single time we had assembly that's what's good yeah that was in winchester ridge primary and even though the kids they were a little bit wayward they were still regulated by that as a result there was never any hard knock fight no intense war and certainly no crazy ridiculous disrespect of teachers in your face out here swearing at a teacher in your face out here Talking back to a teacher, that day, about to, the only fighting that happened was between students. Ain't no kid out here fighting a teacher. Like, never. I have never in my life seen anything of that anomalous nature, ever. Then, went to the last primary school, not primary, so getting a government school ever, my high school. I was there from grade 8 to matric. Same thing. Hymns, choir, basically praise and worship in the morning. Praise and worship in the morning, at assembly, every single day, every single day, right? That's what's good him like yeah even though it was a government school and i have never in my life seen a child having at it with a teacher in grade nine we had this a teacher for accounting mrs peters if you went to sir john you would remember mrs peters my goodness that woman used to call children that were underperforming and essentially out of line when it came to academia rubbishes <laughs> and he would make them she would make them sit at the back of the class because she doesn't want to have to stare into the faces of the, these rubbishes he used to she used to call them rubbishes <laughs> ain't no kid ever went home and said mom mrs peters calls me a rubbish and i feel as if though my my rights are being lambasted at this point this is what 1998 so the constitution of the republic of south africa is act 198 is it of 1996 it's already been entrenched it's already an act it's already enforced we already have rights and yet ain't nobody out there trying to enforce them ain't nobody trying to go to the department of education and say i have rights to not do this and that to hey guys you know what <laughs> i've been speaking for an hour 12 minutes can we please just move to the next part so that i can have comfort in speaking otherwise i'm gonna rush my story because i'm getting to a point let's move to the next part <laughs> 